Welcome to my webinar about uh, reflectometry. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about reflectometry. I'm going to try and introduce reflectometry as a kind of a technique because I understand that not a lot of people um, know a huge amount about it. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about, about some of the data science uh, aspects that we use in reflectometry analysis. Um, so I am Andrew McCluskey. I work as a data analysis scientist um, at the Diamond Light Source, uh, in particular focusing on uh, reflectometry. I also work with ISIS. Uh, I'm funded by the Ada Lovelace Centre, which is a, a data science focused centre uh, based at the Harwell campus. Um, and if you if you want to get in touch with me, I've got my Twitter handle and my my email address and, and my web page. Uh, so it's just about housekeeping, first of all. I'm trying something a bit weird here, and I'm trying to do a kind of chalk and talk lecture by writing on my iPad. So hopefully it works. If it doesn't, uh, put something in the Q&A and, and um, Brian or Claire or someone will see it. Uh, other piece of housekeeping is I have a bit of a regional accent and if at any point you can't really understand what I'm saying because of that, again, if you let Claire or Brian or uh, Glenn or Jenny know, they'll be able to relay a message to me, hopefully, uh, and I can try and clean up the way I talk a bit. Uh, the other aspect is I've been known to swear during talks. I'll try my best not to, uh, but just I'm conscious of that. If people are working from home and, and there's children around, uh, it may be good to put headphones on. Uh, so finally, thanks uh, Brian and Claire and Glenn and Jenny for getting me on to do this uh, hashtag the light stuff talk uh, and hopefully I'll have fun and you guys will as well. Okay, so what is reflectometry? So reflectometry is a technique that we use to study surfaces and uh, buried interfaces. Now, when I mean a surface, I literally mean a surface. So I'll try to draw on a surface. So here's a kind of crude drawing of a surface. So we can imagine this is just a bit of bare silicon, for example. And when you do a reflectometry experiment, you have your neutrons, or your x-rays coming in at some grazing instance. So they, they come in and they bounce off the surface and they get reflected. So over here is the source. So this is the source of your neutrons or your x-rays. Uh, be that a synchrotron, be that a lab source, be that ISIS. Uh, the radiation bounces off the surface and you detect it in your detector, which I'm going to say that is an eye. Now, obviously, you don't want to look at a neutron or an X-ray beam with your eyes, but you know what I mean. Now, one of the interesting things, uh, or the kind of main part of the, the reflectometry experiment is that when you do reflectometry, I'll draw a quick dotted line along here. So this is this line is parallel to the to the edges of the surface. Your instant angle, so your theta i, is the same as your reflected angle, and this is called the the specular case. So you have theta r. So these are the same, and you're doing specular reflectometry, and that's what the focus of this talk is going to be. There is other sorts of reflectometry, like off specular reflectometry, um, uh, which give you different information. The other thing to know about, well, the main thing to know about reflectometry is it gives you a one-dimensional uh, information profile. It gives you information about structure, composition, and and uh, it gives you information about the structure and composition in a particular dimension. And that dimension is in the dimension that we refer to as the Z. So that is normal to the interface, so it's, it's coming out of the interface. Reflectometry assumes that your system is, is homogeneous in the plane, so this area is completely, it assumes homogeneity and it only gives you information in and out of the plane. Now the information that it gives you, so what you end up getting from it is what's called a scattering length density profile. So if this is Z and this is what's called the scattering length. Now what is the scattering length density? So scattering length density, let's write it out. Scattering length density is, oh, that's a beta, I meant to do a row. Oh, there we go. Found as the summation over all of the atoms in the layer, where N is the number density of those atoms, or of that atom, and B is the scattering length of that atom. 
And now the scattering length depends on the number of, if you're doing x-rays, it depends on the number of electrons in your particular atom. If you're doing neutrons, it's slightly different and it depends on interactions within the nuclei. Now this means that uh, neutrons are um, affected by different isotopes differently. So your scattering length, your BI for hydrogen, would be different from your scattering length for deuterium, for example. Now, what is this scattering length density? Well, it's giving you information about the chemical composition of your system in this scattering length, as this is, a, is related to the element. And it gives you information about the, the physical environment. It gives you information uh, about the, the number density that the region is in, that the, the atom is in. Uh, so what ends up looking like? Well, so for this example I've got here with a silicon surface, you would end up with a scattering length density profile where you've got silicon and then above it is just air. So it's bulk silicon and it's a completely flat, sur flat surface. So the scattering length density of air is pretty much zero. You would then have this completely sharp interface and it goes up to the scattering length density of silicon and it would go along. Now you can imagine the circumstance where you have some weird uh, polymorph of silicon for example uh, and you don't know the density of it uh, and you could evaluate the number density based on the fact that you know the scattering length but it's, it can be more interesting than that so if we consider if we had a layer of silicon on top of something else so in this case it's going to be on top of something with a lower scattering length density this would actually give us different scattering length density profile because you would have you would still have your air where there's no scattering length. You would then have your silicon layer, which is the same uh, scattering length density. This would go along for whatever the thickness of the silicon layer would be before the layer that is underneath the silicon would show up. And so that means if you were to do this sort of experiment, you would be able to obtain information about the, the physical environment of the silicon. If you didn't know the chemical composition, however you do, you could get that. And you also get information about this thickness, how thick your layer is. And that's really kind of the essence of what these reflectometry experiments are about. They're about getting depth information about the chemical environment, and the, sorry, the chemical and physical environment that the, the atoms or the molecules are in. Now, that's a bit of a kind of high-level explanation. So let's show you some applications. Uh, just a point, I'm kind of sat on the ground in my, my living room here, so if you hear me shuffling about, it's because my leg's gone dead because I'm sat on it. Uh, so don't worry about that. It's, it's not me going to cut out or anything. Uh, so an application of this sort of system, uh, or an application of using uh, a reflectometry. Uh, this application I'm going to talk about is from this paper from 2010. Uh, I think it's quite pertinent at the moment because it's actually a, a study of a, a, of a protein that's related to the HIV virus. Now, obviously, as we're all kind of stuck inside uh, due to the the um, the coronavirus uh, pandemic that's ongoing, um, I think it's interesting to, to talk about something that's related to, to a pandemic, obviously, a previous pandemic. Uh, so this uh, group, which was actually a group, I believe, uh, from the United States, were interested in studying this, this, part, this virus that was related to the HIV, um, which was related to uh, HIV, sorry. Um, and what the literature kind of description of the structure of this virus took, sorry, the, this protein took, so the literature picture uh, was you would have a phospholipid membrane, so such as something that's in your cells, so that's phospholipid, so I'll just kind of draw it like this roughly. Uh, this phospholipid membrane then has a, a mem the, the, sorry, the protein then has a membrane bound component, a linker polypeptide that then goes to the kind of globular region of the protein. Um, and the, 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 in this paper, they wanted to investigate if this literature uh, idea of what the, the structure was was correct or, or, if, it was, or if it was wrong. Uh, and they decided to use neutron reflectometry to do this. Instead of looking at a phospholipid bilayer, they looked at just a phospholipid monolayer, though. So interestingly, uh, uh, phospho uh, sorry, uh, water, uh, so they have a surface of water. And interestingly, water isn't actually perfectly flat. It has a capillary wave. Uh, and now reflectometry is able to account for that in the analysis. So what they did is they took some water. Uh, so in this particular system, there's air up here. And there's water down here. And they used, they took phospholipid molecules. So phospholipids, like what you would find in your uh, cell membranes. 
uh, which have heads that are uh, hydrophilic, so they love going into the water. And then they have tails that are hydrophobic, so they really don't love going in the water. Um, and they, uh, they self-assembled a phospholipid monolayer on, this, on this, air, this water surface. They then attach the protein via histamine tag. And so if we draw the protein in the literature model, we see that this long linker polypeptide, and then it goes off to the globular region. Uh, so if you were to consider that as a reflectometry model, you would have your air. Uh, you would then have the phospholipid tails. You then have these phospholipid heads. You would then have the uh, water because there's there's quite a distance between the the protein and the layer, so you would have some quite watery layer. Might be a bit a wee bit of protein in there. Then have this protein layer. Oop, spell correctly. Uh, before you would have the final water subphase, the bulk water that it goes into. And now they calculated what the reflectometry profile would be from this system. And it looked nothing like the data that they generated, what data that they'd, they'd measured when they, when they measured this system. Now, why was that? Well, actually, it turned out that if they removed this water layer, and then brought the protein and the water up, they got a lot better agreement with the data. And what that indicates is that the literature model was actually incorrect. And actually the globular protein was coming out, the, the linker polypeptide was coming out, and then the globular protein was actually attracted to these, these hydrophilic head groups, and it was binding to the surface of this membrane. And so this is a kind of, the, the reason that this was possible was because they were getting information in this said axis. They were only getting information in the said axis and they were taking an average picture across the whole monolayer. Further to that, they're not just getting information about the surface, they're getting information about the buried interface. So it's actually below a whole load of, inf a whole load of chemical system. So they have this, this monolayer, but they're actually able to look underneath it and get information from underneath it. Now that's particularly, uh, that's particular to, to reflectometry. Um, and wouldn't necessarily be possible with other techniques. So that's, that's one example that's kind of got a biological focus. I'm going to give you a, one more example before, before I move on to talk about uh, how we actually go about calculating these reflectometry models. Uh, and this example is from this uh, journal, uh, sorry, ACS Applied Energy Materials paper uh, from last year. Now, what these researchers were looking at was dye-sensitized solar cells. So they were looking at a titanium, oxide, titanium dioxide system. So they had, a, they had a bulk surface of titanium dioxide. They then uh, were able to bind these aromatic organic and ruthenium-based uh, complexes to this surface and uh, it had applications as uh, solar cell materials. Now, what is it they actually wanted to know? Oops, I'll just write this in black. What did they want to know? They wanted to know uh, how the coverage was affected by the experimental con conditions. So that's to say how much of this dye ended up on the, the, how much of these dye molecules ended up on the titanium dioxide surface. They wanted to know the tilt angle. So they wanted to know the orientation of these dye molecules. Um, so they wanted to know effectively this angle, uh, and they wanted to know uh, what the implant structure was. Now, hopefully, you're immediately telling me you're immediately screaming at your computers back home that reflectometry is not going to help them get this implant structure, and that is true. And that's true because reflectometry only gives you information in the said dimension. So they're not able to get information about the, if these dye-sensitized solar cells are agglomerating forming nanoparticles. However, there is a sister technique that they used called grazing instance small angle scattering uh, to show that there was indeed uh, nanoparticle agglomerates forming. So they weren't able to get that in plain structure, but can they get information about the coverage and the tilt angle? Well, if we think about a reflectometry model, so we have this, we have this, this subphase layer, which uh, has a scattering density of titanium dioxide. Uh, and then we have this layer where we don't necessarily know what the scattering length density is. It's the, the scattering length density of these dye molecule region. Uh, and then we have air. So that will have a scattering length density of zero. 
I'm just checking to make sure that I've not getting shouted at by Brian. Nope, nothing yet. Uh, so what they were actually, um, so they're, they're able to get, they wanted to find out what the value of this, this row D was. And I mean, what use would that be? What information would that give them? Well, if they could find out the value of row D, blue, if they could find out the value of this row D, they would be able to get, oops, that should be a B. They already knew what the scattering length of these molecules were because they'd synthesized these molecules. They, they, they were their molecular species. They knew what all the atoms were in. And this meant if they were able to determine the, the number density, that would directly relate to the coverage. So this means that actually they were able to get the coverage of their, uh, their, their dye molecules on this interface using reflectometry, using X-ray reflectometry, actually at the beamline I work with. Um, but could they get the tilt angle? Well, if we think about it, the other parameter that, that we can fit, the other parameter that we model when we're making these reflectometry models is this thickness. How thick is this layer? So this is typically given the, 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 the label D. So how thick is this layer going to be? And so again, this, this thickness, they can calculate from the reflectometry. They can, when they analyze the reflectometry data, they are able to determine what this thickness is. And this thickness is obviously related to the shape of the molecule. So if their thickness is D, the shape of the molecule is however long, they can from that using trigonometry determine this tilt angle. So reflectometry was also able to give them this tilt angle that they wanted to find out. So that's kind of two quick examples of applications where reflectometry has been used. I'm now going to talk a bit about this, this reflectometry data. So what does a reflectometry data set actually look like? So I've talked a bit about what it is, but what about some real hard data? So this is some sim simulated reflectometry that I, uh, I simulated from some, the, some mathematical equations. Sorry, I imagine hearing me drink water over my oh, microphone might sound a bit weird. Um, so the, I've got a simulated experiment or simulated data. The system that I'm actually simulated is I've got air, and I've got D2O, and then I've got silicon. Um, and actually, this this the reason I say D2O rather than just saying water is because the D2O is this is effectively neutron data, as uh, neutron reflectometry data. And as I mentioned at the start, the neutrons are sensitive to different isotopes. Now, what we want to do when we're analysing our reflectometry data. Oh, well, first of all, actually, one of the things to note about reflectometry data is it covers a huge dynamic range. So you can see that this is going from a reflectivity, reflect, reflected intensity of 1 all the way down to a reflected intensity of 1 times 10 to the minus 6. And that's due to, due to a natural factor of reflectivity. So reflectivity actually it falls off as a function of uh, q to the 4. That's called the Fresnel decay. So it's, it's the reflectivity uh, is Q to the minus four. So it means that we have to, we have to account for this effectively when our, we're doing our modeling. And sometimes you will see people plot reflectivity curves instead of plotting them as, as R of Q, they'll plot them as R Q to the four of Q. And that's just to get rid of this natural decay. Um, it's up to person, pe pe people which sort of, which way they kind of plot that. But our aim is to actually you like calculate reflectivity from some model that would be similar to this, compare it to our experimental data, and then change our model until we get very good agreement between the experiment and the data. And now this is referred to as model dependent analysis. And now a lot of you might be thinking that's what we all do. Uh, Yep, that is well, model dependent analysis is quite foundational to a lot of experimental analysis um, and a lot of analysis in general. So what we do is we create some model, we compare, uh, we calculate a, an effective reflectivity, a simulated reflectivity, and then we compare it with our data and then we change our model. Uh, but how do we actually obtain this this model reflectivity? How do we how do we generate this reflectivity for our model? Well, actually, in this um, this archive and this paper that's up on the archive, which is a tutorial document that I wrote a couple of weeks ago, 
uh, I actually go through the algorithmic detail of what's called the ABLES or Parat recursive methods. This is a, an algorithm that is used effectively, uh, quite universally now for the calculation of reflectometry from one of these models, from one of these layer models that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. I don't really want to go through all of the maths because I think that might absolutely bore the life out of people. But I'm going to show you a kind of hand wavy explanation of how we can calculate the reflectometry. So if we consider one of these layer models, so we've got a layer, and then up here we've got our layer zero, which is called our superphase. So that in the model, the things I showed you before was typically air. We then have our layer one, which is the layer of interest. We're interested in the thickness of this layer, which we're going to call D1, and we're in, uh, and we're interested in what the scattering length density of that is. So the scattering length density right there. We also we also want to know about the We also can know about the scattering length density of the super, superphase or the scattering length density of the subphase, which I'm labeling too. Now, when you actually do a reflectometry experiment, you would have your uh, radiation, whatever that may be, your X-rays or neutrons, coming in and impacting on the surface at some, some shallow angle. And when it impacts on that surface, it is reflected, and it's reflected at the same angle that it's into it at, as I mentioned before. In addition to that, um, Reflection, you also will get refraction. So the, the, the radiation actually refracts at the interface, similar to how uh, water will reflect, refract light. So this, you get reflection and refraction, and this refraction is actually affected by the values, the, 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 the angle of this reflect, refraction, angle of these two, is affected by the scattering lens densities. You then go to this next interface, and again, you'll get reflection, and you'll get some refraction. And this, because we're now in the bulk and there's no more interfaces, you won't get um, any more refraction or reflection, and the, 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 re the, the beam will just, just dissipate into the bulk. This, this, uh, this wave here that has been reflected and refracted is then refracted again on its way out the second interface. Or this this top interface. So, those of you that, that were that, that listened to to Christine's talk, Christine's lecture last week, or that have done kind of basic uh, crystallography and powder crystallography, you might kind of see where I'm going with this. If you consider your probing radiation to be a, a wave that comes in, this is reflected, and so the, the phase stays the same. So the phase. Uh, doesn't change. However, the radiation that is refract, refracted and then reflected again travels a larger path. And that path is affected by the scattering length density ratio because that affects this angle. It's also affected by the thickness. And so you can see how you would end up in the situation where you get some completely destructive interference or some constructive interference. You can get brag peaks and things like that. Now, the thing is that reflectometry is often on quite disordered systems, and particularly a lot of my work previously is focused on uh, using it on uh, soft matter systems like those lipid monolayers that I showed you at the start. So you don't get these perfectly flat interfaces. You get things that are a lot more lumpy and bumpy, and so instead of getting brag peaks, you get fringes and bumps. Now, this just shows you the way that the, what the, act, the, the algorithmic detail that's discussed in this, this kind of tutorial document, and indeed in this, this is a larger uh, review on reflectometry analysis at the bottom. Uh, this algorithm is actually implementing each of these reflections and refractions. And it's, it's actually, it's taken from optical, uh, optical physics effectively. And what it does is it calculates the, the, the intensity of the final radiation that would come out. So that's how you actually calculate this reflectometry. And obviously, as I say, there's a lot more detail in this paper, in this, this, this tutorial document. So what we end up doing with that document, well, if I'm, sorry, with that algorithm. So if I managed to perfectly simulate my system, which again was air, D2O, and silicon, and I get the thicknesses completely right, and I get the densities completely, completely right, I'll end up with something that hopefully would go through all of my data points. And you would get a really nice agreement between your experiment and your data. And now, 
that is what we all are kind of aiming for when we're doing scattering techniques. And just like all other scattering techniques, reflectometry suffers from the problem of the phase problem. So our experimental data is actually severely opposed. And our, it makes our analysis incredibly difficult. So our data is opposed, which is to say that while this model will give very good agreement to the data, other models could also give good agreement to the data. And it's difficult to determine which is the correct one. And that's where the data science applications come in. And so this, uh, the use of, I'm going to talk specifically about Bayesian inference. And Bayesian inference is a tool that's used very popularly in data, data science. It's actually quite foundational to a lot of machine learning algorithms that are doing things like, I don't know if you've listened to certain news following you around different cities and tracking people that are, um, that have got the, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Um, however, reflectometry uh, analysis that has been using it for a very long time and, that, and actually this is a, a really good uh, introduction to using uh, Bayesian inference and in reflectometry and it's from uh, over, well, how long would that be? Over 20 years ago now uh, by Devinder Sevia. Um, who, if anyone's read the elementary scattering theory textbook, that it's this, that same Devinder Sevia. So what is Bayesian inference? So let's talk about Bayesian inference. It's popular in reflectometry and it has been for a long time. So Bayesian inference is a, is a kind of, so we have, it's the way we think about things probabilistically and how we let our prior knowledge and prior information that we already know affect the outcome of, experiment, of, of, the outcome of our analysis. Uh, and actually, that's, it's really well covered in this YouTube video. This YouTube video is, is from 3Blue1Brown, who's a mathematics YouTuber. I would highly recommend going and watching it if you want to get a more foundational understanding of Bayesian inference, rather than just um, how it could be used in reflectometry analysis. So uh, Bayesian inference, developed by a guy called Reverend Thomas Bayes. Oops. Reverend Thomas Bayes. Uh, he uh, was a, a reverend in the 17th century in England, and he came up with this equation. So his equation says that the posterior probability of our, our given parameters is equal to the likelihood, which is the agreement between our model with the given parameters and our experimental data, multiplied by the prior, our prior knowledge about the given parameters divided by the evidence. And the evidence is, is uh, how well our given model without consideration for parameters describes our experimental data. And this is referred to as Bayes' theorem. Uh, and there's a lot of applications you can go and look at it. I'm gonna focus quickly on a few. Oh, that's not how you spell theorem, is it? I'm gonna focus on a few applications of how that, that applies, how that's used in reflectometry. So the first one is this prior knowledge. How do we integrate our prior knowledge about things into our reflectometry analysis? Well, in reflectometry, we're often, in the stuff that I've done previously, we've been looking a lot at soft matter things, things like phospholipids. And now reflectometry scientists aren't the only people that study, uh, study lipids. They're studied quite extensively. And indeed, this paper here uh, actually looked at uh, performing molecular dynamic simulations of uh, the DPPC lipid. So DPPC is a, a very popular lipid. It's a, what, what's referred to as a physicist lipid. And from these molecular dynamic simulations, they were able to suggest that the volume of this lipid was 1278 uh, 12, 12, point, 1278, no point, plus or minus 26 cubic angstroms. Now, because this value has an uncertainty associated with it, we can actually describe it as a probability distribution. So we describe it as a probability distribution, uh, which is normally distributed, so it's normal distribution, uh, with a mean of this 1287, uh, and the width is related to this 626. But how do we fit this, this volume into our equations? Into our, into our reflectometry model that I've just discussed, how do we get this volume into the scattering length density? Well, I've said that the scattering length density is equal to the summation over all of the atoms or a system. So we can consider trying to evaluate the scattering length density of a given lipid. 
And the way we would do that is we would say the number density of lipids where the uh, and the, the scattering length of the whole lipid, which obviously we know what the composition of our DPPC is, so we can add up all the elements that make up the DPPC, and we would then know this BI value. However, we still don't know this, but if we remember that a volume is simply a recipro reciprocal of a number density, um, this means that we can rewrite, we can reformulate this, this equation so that the scattering length density actually depends on the, the scattering length of the lipid divided by the volume of the lipid. And now this allows us to directly influence the, use our prior knowledge of the lipid volume to directly influence the analysis. And this has led to a, a project that we've been working on between ISIS, Oxford University, uh, and Diamond, uh, where I'm working on developing a, a prior library. So a library. Oops, a library of prior probabilities for different lipids. And so it would mean that if you were doing these sort of analysis, rather than having to go through and trawl through all the literature, there would be a library of these, a library of this information you can go and look at. So that's kind of an I kind of a hand-waving idea of how we can include this prior knowledge and why we would want to. But how does it actually affect things? Well, this comes to posterior sampling. Now, I mentioned that posterior is the, post is the probability of a given parameter, effectively. Now, this, this formulation of Bayes' theorem, the posterior, or, or rather, the likelihood is affected by the given values of parameters, and as is the prior. The evidence is not. The evidence is affected only by, the evidence affected only by the value of the, um, is affected only by the model and not particular parameter values. So we can rewrite this. Uh, if you're varying the parameter models and you're not varying the model, if you're, sorry, if you're varying the parameters and you're not varying the model, this posterior, say we're looking at the effect of the change in the lipid volume, is proportional to the value of the prior for a given value of our volume multiplied by the likelihood, which is the agreement between our model and the experiment. Uh, and what we do then, and this is actually what we do in the analysis of, of, of reflectometry experiments, is we sample. So we go through a bunch of different values of this volume, which is typically in the region of cubic angstroms, uh, and we calculate what this posterior is. So we calculate the value for the prior based on, for example, this, this uh, probability distribution. And we calculate what the likelihood is, which is, which is effectively a chi-squared value. It's, it's the agreement between the model and the data. And doing so, we calculate the posterior. And what that does is that gives us a bunch of different values. So we're running through all the different values of VL. And we're calculating the posterior each time. And now if you do this enough, you'll hopefully end up with a normal distribution. Which, well, that's not that normally distributed, but considering I'm drawing it by hand, that's not bad. Now, what that means is we can then we can then determine the mean value for for that given parameter, and also what the uncertainty is. And this uncertainty means that we're we're obtaining uncertainties on our analysis. We're obtaining we're propagating the uncertainties that are in our experimental data through to our analysis. Now we call these uncertainties inverse uncertainties. So that's just a fancy name for them, but they are essentially the uncertainty. Oh, let's try and spell uncertainty correct. They're effectively the uncertainty on each of your parameters, uncertainties. The other thing that we get from this, uh, this posterior sampling is correlations. So because if we have more than one variable, we can look at how the variables change with respect to each other. And that's really important in the LPOS technique that is reflectometry. Because if you have, you, a lot of your variables are, variables are highly correlated, it's often the case that they should maybe be amalgamated into one single larger variable. Now just to note, this posterior sampling method is called Markov chain Monte Carlo. And it's actually now implemented in the majority of reflectometry analysis packages. Oops, Markov chain, oh, let's try and spell it correctly, Monte Carlo. So if you use a uh, common reflectometry analysis packages like Rascal, which comes from ISIS, or RefNX, which comes from uh, the ANSTO uh, nuclear source, these come with the Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling built in. Uh, and just actually, I know this, this link down here is to a common uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo 
Python library, and this tutorial is really interesting to see the effect that it can have. The final impact of, of Bayesian inference I'm going to talk about is, um, I'm just checking, I haven't got another message from that. Uh, cool. Um, just checking, Brian hasn't been trying to get in touch. Um, the last thing I'm going to tell you about is this evidence estimation. So this, the denominator on this function, which I've told you depends only on the model. So why are we really interested in it? If we're proposing a model for our system, we only want to know information about the parameters of that model. However, let me suggest, if we consider this phospholipid monolayer that I keep going back to, and actually it was, it was what I did my PhD on, so that's why I'm kind of interested in it. So if we consider this phospholipid monolayer, good old phospholipid monolayer at the air water interface. So you can, so previously uh, we modeled this with having air, uh, the phospholipid tails, the phospholipid heads, and then more water within the water. However, what if you were to amalgamate the heads and the tails? What if you would say the heads and the tails could be considered as one large region? And we just do that, the, the, the mass we discussed earlier, where, where we use this BL for the whole lipid rather than the, the heads and the tails individually. So then you could model it as air, uh, the lipid, and then the water. Um, and actually, that's a much simpler model. So if we kind of if we apply Occam's razor, we should really be using a more simple model. But do we have a method where we can reliably compare these? Well, Bayesian inference actually allows us that. If we're able to evaluate this evidence, if we're able to determine what our evidence is, we can compare the model how well the models describe the data. In doing so, we can avoid overfitting. So this allows us to compare between different models where there's different numbers of free parameters. Um, and actually, this uses a method called uh, nested sampling. So nested sampling is a, is, a, is a technique to calculate what this evidence is, and actually it estimates what the evidence is. It gives us a way to, to estimate what this evidence value is. And this allows us to, to know if we're overfitting our data or if we're, able to, if we're underfitting our data. And we actually looked at this in quite a bit of detail in this, this preprint. This is a, it's currently submitted and going through peer review and stuff like that, but feel free to have a read of it. It's looking at uh, using evidence evaluation to optimize the information density of a given uh, um, reflectometry analysis. All right, cool. So we've gotten to the end. I've definitely gone over time, so I apologize to everyone whose time I'm probably wasting and they want to be at the pub. But let's draw some conclusions before we go. So I conclude that reflectometry, reflectometry is cool. That's what I conclude. It gives you information about surfaces, such as that disensitized solar cell I showed you at the start. But it also gives you information about buried interfaces, like that protein uh, monolayer complex. Interfaces. However, there's a problem. As with a lot of scattering techniques, the analysis of reflectometry is ill posed. Oh. The analysis of reflectometry is ill posed, and many different models could, could equally describe some data. So, therefore, it's important for us to be able to include our prior knowledge. So our prior information that we obtained from complementary measurements and simulations. It's also important that we're able to model our data, we're able to reparameterize, and we're able to use chemically informed models. models. And finally, we want to use evidence, we want to use Bayesian inference and all these other tools to just generally improve our, our analysis, to make our analysis more robust, more reproducible, and more well-informed. So with that, I'm going to stop. 
I'm going to say thanks again to Brian and Claire and Glenn and Jenny for all their hard work getting this all set up so that we can come and talk to you. Uh, these are my dogs. This is Sadie. And this is Penny. Uh, they always go at the end of slides for talks that I do because they're, they're cute dogs. And I like to show them off. Uh, I need to thank Diamond and uh, the Ada Lovely Centre for funding uh, my position uh, and allowing me to basically come and talk to you guys about reflectometry and, and the cool stuff I'm doing. And if anyone has any questions, uh, I'll happily try and answer them.